Th this became national news. This was a big news story. 17 people dying in a train accident was big news in 1903, as it, as it would be today. In 1925, Indiana University and Purdue University founded the Old Oaken Bucket, a traveling trophy to be awarded each year to the winner of the long-standing rivalry between the two football teams from their respective universities. By the time that the bucket was introduced to the rivalry, the tradition between the two schools was more than 30 years old, a rivalry that had grown so intense within its first 10 years that by 1903, both college presidents determined that the game at the time could no longer be played at their respective campuses, but instead must be played at a neutral site in Indianapolis. 1903 was scheduled to be the 11th game between the two schools. Purdue had won seven out of 10 of those games. So the IU fans were constantly looking to get their rematch and get their glory against Purdue, and Purdue had this reputation to maintain. Playing the game in Indianapolis was, was, was an effort to uh, control the hooliganism at the games uh, uh, on both campuses. They decided, uh, well, let's try a neutral site. Football at that time was very much like it is today. You, you come to, to IU or, or, or Purdue on a home football Saturday, the campus is exciting. You can just feel it. It's electric. At the turn of the century, Purdue had the upper hand in football, as it did in many aspects of the educational and financial aspects of university development in Indiana. Led by President Winthrop Stone, Purdue was a national leader in engineering and the sciences at a time when the Industrial Revolution was modernizing America. Purdue athletic teams reflected this strong leadership status in the Midwest. By contrast, Indiana University was 50 years older. In many regards, however, it was considered a backwater university, with few navigable roads in and out of Bloomington and the southern hill country of Monroe County. Bloomington was, was a very, very remote area to carry at a state university tag. Purdue was a, a land-grant school. Lafayette is obviously in a much more trafficked area uh, between Indianapolis and then Chicago, a main artery. In 1903, IU's new president, William Lowe Bryan, was out to change all that. The Indiana State Legislature was currently debating which school would host a new medical college, which would mean great prestige and significant financial support from the state. By 1903, both Indiana and Purdue were in a heated battle to determine which university would claim the new medical school. Uh, Purdue and IU became in a, involved in a very intense battle over who was going to have the public medical school, uh, which was going to be located in Indianapolis. That argument made a Purdue-IU basketball game look like a Sunday school picnic. Bryan was bound to boost the profile of Indiana University in any way he could, and to Bryan, Athletics was one way for IU to gain ground on Purdue. The Purdue football team was always strong. and They had a reputation for dominating on the field. The origin of the name Boilermakers was that they played Wabash College and trampled them, basically. And a Wabash newspaper said that they just stormed onto the field like burly Boilermakers and won the day. Despite Brian's best efforts to field a strong football team for the 1903 season, most fans and sports reporters of the day recognized Purdue as a clear favorite in the annual contest. The Boilermakers were led by three all-conference players, fullback Harry Leslie, team captain Simeon Miller, whom the student newspaper dubbed a libertine charmer and a real ladies' man on campus, and E.C. Robertson, the fearless son of a rancher from East Helena, Montana. Enthusiastic support was strong on game day among more than 1,500 Purdue fans who boarded a specially commissioned train headed to Indianapolis the morning of October 31st, 1903. The Purdue special train carried everybody who was going from Lafayette to this football game. That included the football team, coaches, trainers, boosters, community members who were interested in seeing the game or in supporting the team. The band was there, several hundred students, as well as faculty members, professors, even the president of the university, Winthrop Stone, and his family were on the train. At 10.15 a.m., two miles north of Indianapolis, the Purdue train rumbled into town, attempting to make up for lost time spent in boarding hundreds of last-minute passengers, rounding a bend, and making its final push into the downtown area. The engineer of the Purdue train blared his all-clear signal just seconds before looking up in horror to see a series of coal cars parked on the tracks directly in front of it. 
The logbooks for the coal company had no record of a specially commissioned train coming from Lafayette that morning. And now, with only seconds before impact, the horrible reality of this terrible miscommunication was about to collide with stark and sudden consequences. The Purdue Special was intermingled with wooden cars and metal cars because of the way it was pieced together from extra cars that the railway company had available. The front passenger cars on this train were wooden, which means that they broke apart upon impact. It's hard to tell what would have happened if metal cars had been in the front, but they may have absorbed the wreck a little bit better. The front car, the one that had the team on it, basically disintegrated upon impact. It was, it was devastating. The engine went up over the, over the coal cars. The second car with the, the Purdue football team in it also went up. They described the car as being split in two and being kindling by the time it was over. That wooden car was just destroyed, uh, just absolutely destroyed. Those further back on the train felt an abrupt jolt, though most were uninjured. Purdue President Winthrop Stone stumbled from his seat in the fifth car and ran to the front of the accident site, where dozens of his Purdue student body were laying on the ground bleeding and screaming for help. President Stone felt a strong sense of responsibility as the de facto parent for the students at his university. He felt responsible to the parents who had sent their kids to Purdue. He received letters and telegrams constantly trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, the, there were people in the neighborhood there that heard the crash. Women came running with buckets of water and, and rags to, to you know, attend to the wounds of the, of the people who were wounded. 30 minutes after the accident, the Hoosier Special, a train carrying more than 1,000 IU team members, students, and fans, rolled into Union Station in Indianapolis. Their cheers and singing were abruptly interrupted as news of the accident a mile north of them quickly spread through the station. Immediately, Indiana University football players and fans ran to the accident site to help their fallen comrades. Well, I think that certainly it shows that, that uh, Purdue and IU, although we're tremendous rivals in athletics, we're, we're, we're one state. Uh, we're, we're for Indiana. We're, we're for the state of Indiana. We're for the people of Indiana. That's what we exist for. And when the, when the chips are down, we're together. As the bodies of the dead and injured were being removed from the scene, they were being sent to the appropriate locations. So injured people were being sent to the hospitals very quickly, and those who were presumed dead already went to the coroner's office. Within the first 24 hours, as news of the accident spread across the headlines of local, regional, and national newspapers, telegrams began to pour into an Indianapolis hotel room that served as the makeshift headquarters for Purdue President Winthrop Stone. Frantic notes from parents begging his office to respond quickly. Some news were encouraging, others were not so lucky. E.C. Robertson, the son of the Montana ranching family, died instantly. Though communications in that area of the country were so slow, his parents did not find out about his death for three days. The scene of this wreck was gruesome. It was bloody. People were destroyed. You know, many of the injured had terrible injuries that there was no way they could have survived. Among the most sensational of all the stories that exploded into the scene on October 31st, 1903, were the circumstances that surrounded fullback Harry Leslie. On board the first train car that absorbed the greatest impact of the accident, Leslie and several of his teammates were thrown more than 20 feet through the air, landing on a pile of coal alongside the tracks. Feeling no pulse, a medical assistant on the scene declared Leslie dead and delivered his body to the coroner's office. Upon examination, Leslie's arm suddenly twitched, startling the coroner, who quickly discovered that Leslie was in fact alive. Rushed to the hospital, Leslie survived more than five hours of emergency surgery. There wasn't even a telegraph office at the university. It was in downtown Lafayette. So people had to go back and forth from Lafayette to West Lafayette to convey these messages. Faculty members at the university, once they were aware of the situation, fielded these messages as best they could. The Indianapolis Journal, one of several regional and national newspapers to cover the events of October 31st, 1903, called the event an appalling catastrophe. In all, 17 people, including 14 football players, died in the Purdue train wreck of 1903. President Stone was wrought with emotion. For weeks, he battled the coal companies in court to seek justice against those responsible for the coal cars that were errantly scheduled on the tracks 
on the morning of October 31, 1903. His battles only netted families a maximum of $3,500 per life lost in a general settlement that then cleared the coal company of any other wrongdoing. The results crushed President Stone's spirit, so much so that in ensuing battles with IU over the new medical school, Stone could not bring himself to battle his in-state rival any further. IU gained control over the Indianapolis Medical School in 1908. Soon after the accident, there were calls at Purdue to construct a memorial gymnasium in honor of those who died. It seemed like a fitting tribute to those who had died on their way to a football game. It would reinvigorate the spirit of athletics at Purdue, and doing it in honor of those people seemed like a good step forward. Opening in 1909, the Purdue Memorial Gymnasium hosted numerous sporting events for more than 50 years. Now known as Haas Hall, the Purdue Memorial Gym features 17 steps leading into the facility, one step for each of the lives lost that fateful October day in 1903. President Stone made sure that Purdue faculty members attended each one of the 17 funerals that were held in every area of the country, including one faculty member who rode by train more than 1,600 miles to attend the funeral of E.C. Robertson in East Helena, Montana. And even though he spent the rest of his life walking with a cane due to his injuries in 1903, Harry Leslie, fullback for the Boilermakers, returned to Purdue to earn his degree and eventually enter politics. He was elected Indiana's 33rd governor in 1928. The train wreck has been a big part of Purdue history since it occurred. It changed the Purdue community, it changed the face of the student body, and it impacted Purdue athletics.